Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you as we gather again for a look at the lessons via the live stream or the recorded stream. Right. Uh, we will be doing this through uh, July and August, and we may carry it on a, a little bit further after that, just to be a resource, not just for our own members, but for others out there that through the week might be able to tap in and, and take away a, right. a, a word from it. Uh, so uh, Pastor Rushi and I are glad to be with you this morning, and uh, we're going to take a look at the Old Testament and uh, the gospel lesson for today, uh, or that will be preached uh, this week on Sunday. So uh, why don't we begin with uh, the collect of the day. So let us pray. O God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The uh, text for today, the, the gradual that is a part of the, uh, the readings and so forth, that's part of the propers that change the propers. Whenever you hear that word, these are the elements in every worship service that change each week. Right. The readings, the intro, the psalm, the hymns, and so forth, all of these. Well, the gradual, which brings us between the epistle and the gospel, there's a line in it from Romans chapter 11. It says, O oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and inscrutable his ways. And this unscrutableness is kind of kind of on display in the readings yeah. here uh, for this morning. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we're going to take a look at Ezekiel. We're starting at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Now, Pastor Rishi, would you go ahead and read that for us, please? Yeah. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Okay. Okay, this seems kind of a bit of a, an interesting way of... Uh, <laughs> Of commissioning someone. You know, it's it's uh, just shy. It's a day shy of a year of my ordination. Uh, can you imagine if this was the ordination text? Yeah, and, and the interesting thing, as vicious as it almost sounds, it is literally a merciful thing mm-hmm. uh, to to the people of Israel. And it, it steps back and it, it does a lot to redefine the purpose of the pastoral or the prophetic ministry. Because we think the purpose of the prophetic ministry is first and foremost that we gather numbers, that people come and, and all of this, that we get this good outcome. Right. And what God is saying is the goal, the purpose of the prophetic, the pastoral ministry is first and foremost that the word of the Lord is put to the ears, the hearts, and the lives of the people. Mm -hmm. Success as a prophet is not how many people are converted, but did you sow that seed? Did you give them my word, not the world's word? Right. Now, one of the things I thought was, was interesting in this is uh, Ezekiel is called, but God never calls him by name. He calls him son of man, yeah. which is also the title Jesus takes. Mm -hmm which points to the reality that Ezekiel is in the chain, in the line of the prophetic messengers of, of Christ and of God. And that's why I think it echoes even into the absolution is when we absolve uh, the congregation or the individual, it's never in our name. Right. It's, it's never in our name. It's it's that, you know, that in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. 
I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, not of Mark or, or John or, or Ryan as in Pastor Climola. But it's the idea that that prophetic office and its work continues, not because of the individual, but because of the call of right. God, the commissioning and the like. So what do you, what do you take away from this, this first part of this text here? Well, you know, I, I think, so I want to I look at verse four. It's very interesting. So thus says the Lord God. Normally when Yahweh is speaking through one of the prophets to the people of Israel, you know, it, it's not uncommon for him to say, thus says the Lord, but it's always your God. Here it's different. It's, I don't know if there's anything there or if it's just kind of uh, something that, that maybe I'm looking too far into. But even in, in chapter three, it doesn't it doesn't include the your God. Uh, it's just that he is the God. Well, and see, the interesting I, I agree with what you're saying, but you have to consider what is the context Mm -hmm. Ezekiel's call into the ministry, he was of the priestly family. He normally would have just gone and, and basically been trained in the priestly duties and stuff like that. God takes him and sets him up as a prophet. The context is Israel is just finishing up the last of its exilic movement into Babylon. They got 70 years ahead of them. Now, I think a, a critical thing to, to keep in mind is this, is the people, as God describes them, the people are in exile because they don't know who is the Lord their God. Right. If you understand what I'm saying. He is their God. So what he has Ezekiel do is he has Ezekiel speak to them in objective terms. This is the Lord God. Now, he has a relationship to you, and you have one with him, but you don't know him. So what he does is he introduces him objectively right? so that they might again, oh, oh, and, and then seeing that this is the Lord God, they will, through the work of the word, repent, turn, believe in him, mm -hmm. and so forth. And the one of the things that I, this is my takeaway from it, is also when... It's easy when you think something is yours to take it for granted. And, and that's exactly what they had done. Yeah. And now, and, and, and literally God has stepped away from them. They have in fact told the prophets, don't be saying this stuff. We don't want to hear from the Lord. We don't want, and so I think that's a huge part of why he says the Lord God, this objective one. You don't want to know him? That's fine. This is who he is. His being doesn't depend on our willingness to hear him as he is or, or to, to see him as he is. He is objective. He is consistent regardless of how we, this rebellious people, perceive him to be you know, or yeah. how we desire him to be. He is the way that he is. And, and, it, and it, it's echoed out in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's an objective statement. The world refers to every person in his creation and his creation. That's objective. That means it's there for all. And he says, the Lord God, it's there for all. He's already pointing to the universality of God's and the Lord, the term Lord here. It's an interesting one in four here because he doesn't use the word Yahweh. Lord here is not, if you look in your Bible, you'll find the word is not capped. So the Lord here now, he's introducing himself to them as the one who brings the law. The one who is exercising his authority to discipline and to chastise them because they would not receive him as the Lord who blesses, forgives, and renews. And, and that's, that is perhaps where they were at the most is they thought that there's no way God would, you know, that God would somehow call them to account. You know, we, we, we got this. And, and so, again, I think it's, it's a critical thing to keep in mind that he does, not, he does not speak as Yahweh in this term. He speaks to me more as the one who holds lordship, 
i.e. mastery, more in the authoritative discipline, yeah. I will decide your he, life type. He leads with Adonai in that, in that instance. Uh, Adonai, one of the Hebrew words for, for God, um, you know, typically translated as Lord. Um, Elohim is the other one, and that's kind of more God. Uh, yep, yep. So uh, it's not uncommon in Hebrew when you see uh, Yahweh Elohim or Yahweh Adonai, but here it's Adonai leading that uh, to kind of drive home that point of, yeah, I'm I'm governing over you. And and if you think about the context, you know, they're in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, you know, they're they're in the midst of that because uh, Ezekiel later he will he'll give this parable of the two eagles. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and talk about the continued rebellion that the people of Israel are going through. And uh, even in their captivity, they're afforded privileges that others may not have been. Right. You know, the, and that's kind of what uh, Ezekiel is getting at with that first eagle who is grooming this this uh, shoot uh, of, a, of, a, of a vine. And then there's a second eagle, which represents Pharaoh, who comes in and makes all these bold and brash promises of, you know, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do all these things Mm -hmm. the whole time. He's got the pruning shears in his hand and is ready to cut off the the vine at the, uh, the root of its its growth. Mm -hmm. Um, But the people of Israel, instead of going with the one who had been appointed by God to be their Lord, to be their Adonai, to be their earthly ruler, they rebelled against that. And so what happened was the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Right. The interesting thing that I, I find fascinating in this context is the he calls him to start preaching. And part of his message, first and foremost, is going to be you're in this situation because of what you did. He's got that. And see, talk about something people aren't going to listen to. You know, it's you know, it's not it's the woman you gave me, Lord, you know, you know, and. And see, that's the most fascinating thing is that his message isn't going to be popular. But the critical thing in his message, though, is it will be true. And the truth will out. It will remain. It will endure. And the interesting thing, the length of time, it's just like the wilderness wanderings of Israel. That was a form of exile as well because of their unbelief. The other reason for the term of the exile, the length of it for the Israel coming out of Egypt, was that the generation who refused to believe, to know God as he had shown himself to be in the miracles in Egypt and in the manna provided, was that that generation die. And that a new generation rise up and see and behold that look what the Lord has done. And the next two generations after Israel is in exile, will see not only God have the king that took them captive, bring them back, but that king's going to pay for their temple right? and, and so forth. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, that the first message is good, they're going to have to hear is it's because of what you've done. And then you see that echoed out in some of the Psalms where they finally acknowledge it's because our fathers did Right. And and that's always easy to say, well, it's because our fathers did. Well, you're still your father. You still have, you are still a rebellious people, right? right. Well, you know, no one, no one likes to take accepts No one likes to accept their own, their own faults. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one of the, the things that we're really, really great at is finding ways to try to worm and weasel our way out of accepting uh, the blame for ourselves. And yeah. when, when Ezekiel's tasked with this, um, and I don't want to jump to the gospel lesson quite yet, so I, I'm going to just kind of make an allusion to it, and then we'll, we'll come back to it. it. It's kind of predicating what Jesus experiences when he he's run out of his hometown, because what he does is he shares that you know there are things that they need to take responsibility for. There are things that are are, are going to be unpopular, but that doesn't stop Ezekiel or Jesus from from sharing these messages of truth. Right. Because right. the truth, while it may not be popular, it is true. Right. You know, it's it's objective. It doesn't rely on your uh, your version of things, your your uh, interactions with them. You and know? yeah, and and 
in the end, it will dismiss your versions and variations of the truth mm -hmm. and, and the like. It, it will will out. The one thing I think is interesting that kind of, you wonder if they would have said this to Ezekiel, but they certainly said it to Jesus in the gospel. It's like, how dare you presume to speak for God? Well, I don't. God's the one who dared me to speak. Right. You know, yeah. that, I mean, that's, that's the most interesting thing is the, the, the charge against it. I think a significant thing in terms of, of the image that you follow in this text is early on, the Lord says, he says, this, he says, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And of course, he fell prostrate before the Lord, which is right. what, what, what ought to happen. The interesting thing, though, is to fall prostrate on the Lord and the like. It's like Joshua when, uh, when they lost against uh, the Amorites and so forth because somebody kept the gold. They laid down in the dust and they put dust, they prostrate before the Lord. And again, God says, stand up. And that's one of the things I think is, may seem rather odd is it's what God always does for the repentant. The repentant acknowledge their nothingness in sin, their dustness, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it's by the word of God, he resurrects, he stands up, he puts us on our feet. And he says, all right, now go. This is what I have given you to do. And for him, it was to, to preach that word. Now, one of the things that is, it echoes here and it echoes into the next as well, is, is the, the success of the prophetic ministry is not whether people are converted, but whether the servant has faithfully spoken the word of God to them. Not whether near there, not just condemning, but the law and the gospel set before their eyes. And I'm kind of jumping ahead with this, but I think the the most critical thing of of when he says you are a rebellious people. Um, Original sin basically means we're hardwired to rebel against not, yes, God, but against any kind of authority. And we see that wholesale in our society today. Mm -hmm. And so the rebellion against authority is found more than anything else today in getting rid of authorities and, and so forth. But the most critical thing is, is, here, as in the gospel lesson, the call is to repent. The call is to turn to the Lord. Now, it almost seems like God doesn't care. Well, preach to them whether they hear or not, you know, but they'll know that a prophet was among them. Now, if they're tossing the guy out, if they're treating Jesus like this, how are they going to know there was a prophet among them? And the interesting thing, in, and I'm kind of sweeping ahead here a little bit, but Paul in the epistle lesson speaks about weakness, that he had been given a thorn to lay upon him the reality of his weakness. And, and the most interesting thing that God says to Paul, and it's very, very true, is my grace is sufficient for you. It's made perfect in weakness. All right. Now, the difference here is you have the rebel and the repentant. It's the only two paths. Jesus and his family and the people who, it's the only two paths, repentance or rebel. The interesting thing is, is those that repent have experienced, know, and understand their weakness, their helplessness. And so they look someplace for hope and for help. The rebel doesn't acknowledge the weakness, can't see the weakness, but the weakness will come to them. It may come on the last day when they're dying, and suddenly the, the weakness is just overwhelming. The critical thing is, did they receive a word of hope? Did they receive the message of God that would not only overcome their weakness, but would also gain them a victory in the midst of weakness, be their strength in their weakness? And that's the critical thing that God's saying here is preach it. The way they're going to know they had a prophet among them is when the word rings true, right? When it, oh, there's hope in that word. Now, they aren't going to say, oh, I remember pastor so-and-so. That doesn't matter. It's that the word of life was sown. And in the moment of weakness, that's when she sprouts. Mm -hmm. 
And so the faithfulness in sowing the word has to be, I I love the hymn, preach the word and plant it home. It'll rise when the Lord says, and and look at the parables that led into this, the seed, sowing of the seed, the sowing of the mustard Mm -hmm. seed. The rebel thinks it's nothing, okay? The repentant got nothing and they want it. And so while it seems as if God is being completely indifferent, well, if they hear, they hear, but they're going to know there was a prophet. And not everybody receives that conversion, that awakening to the word, the necessity for it at the same time. Right. Well, I think that's the, the thing that stood out to me as I was prepping for this, this weekend was it's, it's, it's okay to fail. That... You know, no, no, I, I did. Well, finish, finish. I'm sorry. Finish. In, in the sense of how we normally think of success in, you know, we shared the gospel with this many people and they all came to church with us and, and got baptized. Okay. That between Ezekiel being told this and, and Jesus telling the disciples that there's going to be people who, who may not want to hear what you've got to say. Say it anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and see, that's, that's where God is realigning, as does Jesus and even Paul, is that, you know, people can find any reason to be offended. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the gospel, because they took offense at Jesus mm-hmm. and so forth. But part of it is, is this, this reality that success is salvation. Success is not whether they acknowledge you or you see the immediate growth right. from it. And that's what God's saying. You, you define success by whether you're preaching the word. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, tr- preach it as clearly and, and applicably as possible so that it rings and, and it's planted securely into those contexts of weakness so that when they find themselves there, there they have that, that saving mm-hmm. word. And, and that's, that's the most glorious thing is that this word has the ability that no matter how rebellious we are, uh, this word is greater than it. And maybe a better way to phrase what I, what okay. I was trying to get at is it, Jesus, redef- you know, the, the, the scripture lessons today redefine how we view success or failure. Maybe that's a better way to phrase it because... It, 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 I agree. Okay, you're absolutely, I, I don't disagree. I like how you, 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 even what you said before I get. My question is... Who needs to accept his definition of success? Is it just the pastor or is it the church? I think it's both. It is. It's because we need to accept that as pastors, as prophets. Right, right, right. Because it's so easy for us to, and this is, again, bringing in something from the gospel lesson, add to, you know, the, the efficacy of the word. You know, that, well, I did this. I, you know, it was the word and this, this thing. But as, as a church, to kind of have that view that it's not about the immediate all the time. It's about having the, the true word preached there. Um, I, 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 I love this, this saying. I don't remember who I stole it from, um, so I can't give credit. But uh, when, when, everything, when everything else falls away, there in the narrow place of life stands the cross that that's how you measure the success of the prophet. That's how you measure the success of, of, of preaching and the, the work of the church is that isn't the, the people that, that join, isn't the increase in attendance or anything like that, but it's in those moments where the things of this world fall away, where the people that you connected with, where the people that you shared God's love and his gospel with able to cling to the cross when nothing else was there for them. And, and you may never know exactly. if that happens. And that's why I wonder with, for Ezekiel, when he finally was called to his glory, did he ever for a moment see any, any uh, like even Isaiah or Jeremiah, did they yeah. ever see any of the benefit of their preaching the word in their lifetime? I, probably not. Oh. Probably not. But see... Therein lies the key is the, the whatever return comes from preaching, it's got to be the Lord's. And I mean, I've had it said to me again, you need to avoid talking about these things or this or that or the other, that clearly what God says, because if you do, you're going to drive people from the church. Yep. The question then becomes is, 
you know, were they with the church or what did they believe in? And so that's why we have to faithfully preach the word. Mm -hmm. um, and as the hymn says, plant at home. Uh, one of the things I want to touch on real quick, the, in the, in the, uh, the way God describes them, uh, when he says they're impudent and, and stubborn. Uh, and the interesting word here is the, uh, it literally means uh, the obstinate or the impudent means hard of face or basically hard headed. And uh, I, I like the, the, the other one, the stubborn is basically their hard of heart. And, and so forth. Uh, and I, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment when we talk about in the gospel lesson, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, when they referred to what he, his profession, I, we'll, we'll touch on that. Right. So let's go to the gospel lesson yeah. here for today. Uh, we're in the gospel of Mark. We're at chapter six uh, for today, six verses one to 13. And up to this particular point, we've seen Jesus rejected by uh, his family, for the most part. But here we tend to see his rejection by the community at large, right? In, in which he's found, and so forth. So, it's uh, it's the beginning of the oppositions, not just from the Pharisaical leaders, but from the people who you'd think would be natural allies to his cause, uh, they too are, are at play with this. So uh, I, I think it's important to note also that this, this section of scripture, it does follow last week's gospel lesson where he raised uh, the daughter from the dead. Um, so I don't know how fast news traveled, but he's already done kind of his highest earthly miracle already is, you know, he's raised someone from the dead, right. and then he's still... But but you can see in the quest, the, the idea here that they're offended, if you will, mm -hmm. the, you, you can see it because, see, she wasn't dead three days, so she probably really wasn't dead. So, you know what I'm saying? They yeah, can completely right, right. dismiss, which which we, you know, we tend to do with that. So uh, let's take a look here at Mark chapter 6. You want to read that? Please? Yeah. And he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his, in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went out about the, the villages teaching. Okay. All right, awesome. Do you want to stop there? Or do you want to uh, take the, the rest of the... The reading as well. No, let's pull it together. I okay. think we should, yeah. And he called up the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirit. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. All right. These almost look like they're unrelated, but they really are. They are very, very much mm -hmm. uh, a related context. Um, um, of course, the interesting part here is the fact that as we, as you look into this and so forth, the people in the synagogue acknowledge, you know, basically when they say, saying, where did he get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? And how are mighty works done by his hand? 
All right. What's so fascinating in this context is they can acknowledge everything he's doing, but yet everything he's doing isn't enough to keep them from being offended at him because of what they're familiar with about him. And the, the interesting thing here, how they do this, and this is where it echoes again into the, the sending out of the others. Yeah. Okay. Is when they start out, they use these words here. All right. Isn't this not the, the carpenter? And this is why I want to touch on the thing. A carpenter was a really, it, it, was, an in, it was an interesting thing. A carpenter is one who technically works with hard surfaces. And you think of the hard heads, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just a kind of a, a bit of a pun with that. But first off, saying he was a carpenter, they basically limit what his abilities are to that of mere carpentry. And carpentry, for the most part, was not under someone a builder of houses. This was somebody who tended to build tables and maybe utensils and bowls, literally small things. The idea here, this is a, a maker, a handler of small things. How is he handling mighty things? Right. Now, the greater, the interesting thing is the insult comes in that they do not refer to him as the son of Joseph, which was the title you normally did, but they denigrate him by referring to his mother. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, a slight insult and so forth. And uh, the, he goes on to name the, we know these people here and his sisters, aren't they still with us? And they took offense. And what was fascinating is what they knew personally about him was, was what they believed sufficient enough to know enough to dismiss that he could be anybody. Right. That, that what they knew about him put limitations on what he ought to be able to do. But the most striking thing is, is it's also an attempt to save themselves from what he's actually saying. Mm -hmm. uh, the word offense is called scandalon. Now, one of the interesting terms, I think it's skalizomai, uh, in the Greek, but one of the things that it talks about, the word itself refers to one who sets a trap for themselves. And the interesting thing is, is the trap closing is literally they have trapped themselves in the confines of what they think, that they can't get, they're, they're caught. They're caught, they're entrapped by their own thinking, by their own prejudice, by their own weakness, that they, they're, not, they're, they're not free to actually see or receive or be blessed by Jesus. They're, they're trapped. The interesting thing, though, with the, 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 the concept of this type of scandalon is that they're offended at his teachings. Now, the interesting thing is, is when it goes on to say here that he could do no miracles, it's not that he couldn't do miracles but love kept him from miracles. And why is that? The only hope for a miracle, if you will, doesn't per se convert. It's an event that happened. A miracle is a manifestation of the power of the words one speaks. And if they're not receiving his words, they'll be judged by the words. If he does this miracle and they still don't give credence to his words, it escalates the level of judgment. So rather than escalating this level of judgment against them, he continues to have the word preached. And, and so the only hope for somebody entrapped or offended is by a continuing uh, preaching of the word because the one offended will again run into that weak point the offenses they're rebelling, right. they'll run into that moment of weakness and suddenly the word that was sown, that continued to be sown, it will sprout. And we know like James, who's mentioned here, the brother of our Lord, he became James that wrote the, the letter of James mm -hmm. that we have in the New Testament. 
He became the leader of the Jerusalem church. In fact, he presided over the first council in Jerusalem. And he's the one who handed down how the church would go forward and right. so forth. So this, they were offended, but it doesn't mean, okay, you're offended, to heck with you, I'm on my way. No, just keep preaching the word. Right. And where his family and his friends will not assist him in this ministry, he turns to those whom God has made a part of his the family of God to now carry the message out. Right, right. He kind of takes what he what he said three chapters ago, um, and I think that's kind of the underlying that that to continue something we've been saying that planted the seeds. Uh, you know, when he said that these aren't my mother and, and brother and sister, but rather those who the Father has appointed are my mother and brother and sister, and to be so dismissive of his family. You know, that's kind of, who are you? You dismissed us the last time and now you come back to us, you know, and you know, you're doing all these yep. great things. You know, I, I, I wonder how many people who, you know, dismissed the mighty works of his hands. Yeah. Uh, still wanted those same hands to make their tables or make their utensils who they wanted him to remain that carpenter because then he was of use to them. Well, and then they, they see, it's an interesting thing. In one of the, uh, what do we call the, it's referred to as seven deadly sins or seven capital sins is envy. Mm -hmm. And envy, we tend to think of it as, well, envy is just wishing you had what somebody else had. No. Envy in sin is pride's assassin. Sinful pride's assassin. You have to destroy someone who is a threat, somebody who exposes that you're not all you think you are or you're not as, as right as you think you are. And so envy always comes in and says, well, yeah, he's doing these mighty works, but he's just a carpenter. Yeah. And suddenly now he's not a threat to me because he's just a carpenter. Carpenters don't threaten me. But the, the saddest part in this, in this chapter with these people, and for people yet today, is here's the Son of God offering them the words of life, of salvation, and they can completely dismiss them and think they're just fine. How many saints walk away from church because, well, life's just fine? Unaware that they cut themselves off from the words of life. Unaware that, that they, they, they're hiding behind their offense of something but the most frightening thing is they go away believing they're just fine. Right. And this gives rise to why we constantly run into thorns. It's why God says in Deuteronomy, I am the one I wound and I kill, that I, and I heal and I make alive. Why, why wound, why kill? So that we, with our rebellion, with our hard-headedness, might run into the reality we are wounded. Right. We are dead spiritually and we got nothing. And turn to the one who heals and who makes whole, not if you have enough to pay, but because he will pay the price. Right. And so Paul's words of weakness just echo, you know, yeah, they dismissed him today. But, but that's why he says keep preaching the word because they need to know, they need to know that a prophet was here and if it was, they see while that prophet said this, they find the words of, of, of life. And so he sends the people out um, into, in, you know, into the communities and so forth. Now, you were talking about this. What do you make of, from the fact that he tells them, don't take anything you need to survive on? What do you, what, what do you take away? You were talking about yeah, that. Yeah, well, it's, it's the dependence that it forces, you know, that they can't by their own independence or by their own doing, you know, uh, their success isn't going to be measured by how much they prepped, you know, for the long journey, how much, how much money did they bring with them? You know, even the tunic thing, I think is very interesting, but, but it was in looking into it, wearing of two tunics, it was a sign of, of status, you know, that it was, well, I have the ability to wear two tunics. I, it, it sounds silly to us, but think about the things that we think of as status symbols and how silly they would sound to the disciples uh, or the even the to wear only sandals. Uh, 
we often think of the biblical footwear being only sandals, but they had more kind of in line with what we might think of as uh, as shoes. And, and what that's to convey is uh, it it was it was less sturdy. The sandal was was less supportive, less less sturdy. So they really had to rely on the hospitality of those who they were preaching to, and on God which worked through the hospitality of those who, who they were preaching to. It's to, to really remove any outside factors, any, any own strength, any own uh, ability or, or, or preparation or, or uh, previous experience from these, uh, these disciples as they go out. They're going to be completely dependent on God for this seed to be planted and sprout. I, I just think it's a really cool way that he presents it because I don't know. It's, it, it's so contrary to uh, how we often think, you know, with we want to be independent. We want to be separate. We want to, you know, I can do this myself. Thank you very much. And even in our, our sharing of, you know, the gospel, sometimes it's, it's easy to bring our own things into it, to add our own, mm-hmm. our own strengths, you know, or, or think of our own ways that we've helped support the gospel, you know, well, God, and, and I had, you know, this to fall back on as well. So I, I don't know. What, what do you? Uh, I, I don't I don't disagree. With you. I think there's a flip side that goes hand in hand with what you're saying is that basically when they came to these people, the only thing they could offer the people was the word he gave them. So basically they came as nobodies, as as poor nobodies. And, and if that offends you, that offends you. But the only thing they had that could be a benefit to those people was the word they brought. Yeah. And, and it's an interesting thing is he has them present themselves to these people with no status. No worldly status whatsoever. So that the only thing that, that really these people have the impression if something sting that they take away from it is what they actually said. What they actually said. And that, I think, is is what he's trying to get at, is not only will you be provided for in the preaching of the gospel, as Paul talks about, but the reality is, is that basically the only thing you have is the word. And, and that's the most striking thing, is they would also be messengers that to these people that as long as you have the word of God, you have enough. Right. And so I I just find it an interesting thing because I I saw this when I was on vacation is that you look at people and you look at what they're wearing, how they're dressed and stuff like that. You try to piece together their story. Mm -hmm. And once you piece together their story, you know what to do with them. These guys come with, he's a filthy beggar, dirty feet. All he's going to need his feet washed. He's going to need a lot of things. You know, he's got nothing, but 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 he's got these words he's talking, mm-hmm. and he's got this ability to cast out a demon, to you know, and 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 so it's like, well, whatever he doesn't have, he has that, and I think that's that's a flip to it. Is he's telling him, I'll provide for you, but he also is packaging them as people who have nothing but a word right. and the power of God, and and that's the most striking thing. I, uh, I was talking with a, a congregation uh, while I was away that they're looking for a pastor and everybody's telling them, no, you need to get a young, well-dressed, modified dressed and stuff type person, stuff like that. So it appeals to the eyes and the minds of people so that they'll hear the word. And, and I, I get what they're trying uh-huh. to say, but the problem is then is that, is that the, the belief and the problem is, is if they need that as the requirement to be able to hear the guy, then we're emphasizing more, well, make sure you wear two tunics. Right. Make sure you wear these particular sandals mm-hmm. and so forth. And, and the Lord is like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just one of those interesting turns that he presents, uh, presents in this. And, uh, and the interesting thing is they... You know, after Jesus' family dismisses him, he still goes out into villages. He yeah. is on a on a mission, 
and to he's showing what will happen. This is a mini Pentecostal moment, right? When he sends them, you know, sends them out in preparation for what they will, you know, they will actually mm -hmm. uh, do and the like. So uh, it's a it's an interesting thing because it's there's more things beginning to happen here in his ministry, and more people are getting involved, and yet again it's perpetually dismissed. Right. But yet. I, I always love it because his family who dismissed him, many of them are converted, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the thing is that even with this is to the point I was making earlier, you know, even if we looked at this and said, well, this was a failed mission attempt, it didn't it didn't win souls for the kingdom. It didn't, you know, uh, it didn't increase attendance or increase uh, baptisms or anything like that in the immediate sense, you know, you're right. It would be failed by those metrics. Yeah. But over time, those mustard seeds that were planted grew into these mighty bushes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it just, I think it, it's reframing how we view success in mission work, especially. And I think it also, I, to pick up on what you're saying, I think it also reframes how we look at effective means and timing of the means. Because when you think about sending them out, like you said, basically stripped down to nothing. They got nothing, yep. okay? And, and that's how they're gonna come. Well, this ain't much. You're, you're, you're supposed to be a representative of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> what a poor package you are. Well, look at, look at water with regard to baptism. Right. A, a, a bite of bread and a, and a sip of wine. Okay, the fumbling, bumbling individuals God calls to be the pastors. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'm sharing in with the message tomorrow of, of a, a thing in my second congregation that was a, a, a really overwhelming moment of, of the, the guy who dismissed the word being preached until he was confronted with radical weakness. And uh, I, it just it was just a, an interesting an interesting time uh, for that because I was blown away at how honest he was in in just the denigrative way he thought of me and what I was doing and everything else until tragedy struck right and and so forth and then he was begging you know, for the words of eternal life in that moment and just asking for forgiveness and so forth. And that's where really the, the, the faithfulness in proclaiming the word, you hope that, you know, repentance will be there and conversion will be there. Mm -hmm. But the more important thing is that you're laying the eternal medicine to hearts right. and minds right. so that at the time of God's choosing, it, it will sprout because right. none of us is a finished product. And that's the thing I always pray for or, or help parents who struggle because their children have walked away. I said, you know, for your time, you planted the word home. And yeah, they may be rebelling against it now, but weakness is coming their way. And it may be a hard week. I don't want that. Forget it. You, that's the way they've chosen. But you got to understand the, the goal of God pressing weakness upon us is his strength. Exactly. And, and, and we think it's, it's weakness, and it really isn't. It really isn't. So, any other takeaways from this text? Uh, I just think verse five is kind of funny. He could do no mighty work there. Well, except that he healed a couple people. Uh, the the dismissiveness with which that's kind of almost treated of. Yeah, he, he healed some people, but I I just found it funny. Pastor Pamela and I were laughing about that the other day when we were talking about the text, um, but. Uh, you know, it, it's just, I, I love this text. And part of it is I have a sentimental attachment to it. It was the first time I got to preach at my home church. Uh, no, second time. Second time I got to preach at my home church. Uh, I, this was the, the gospel lesson. And uh, it was shortly before I left for my vicarage. I think it was the Sunday before I left. So uh, not only was I uh, pre a prophet in his hometown, but I was being sent out uh I had a little bit more than a, a pair, a pair of sandals and and, and uh, you know uh, a single tunic. I was going to Wisconsin. I needed a little bit more than that, but uh, uh, it just was was that sentimentality still that kind of pops up when you reflect on this text because you know it was kind of the the sending off that I got from my my home congregation to go on my vicarage and you know 
they didn't turn away from you, did they? No, you know, I, I was joking with uh, one of the, the elders who, who's now been sainted. Uh, you know, hey, can you make sure no one brings any tomatoes into the sanctuary today? Because, uh... <laughs> I, uh, Dr. Daniel Roining, who was the uh, dean of chapel when I was at seminary, he told us uh, when we had our first uh, liturgics class, he was sharing his experience when he first went, and this was the text, <laughs> how they offended. And he, you know, he preached and so forth like that. And he said he, he, he was worried about it, you know, because, but it said it also, you know, that's why he was there and stuff. But he said the thing that frightened him the most or just, just really made him kind of take a step back was when they uh, would get, when they would uh, pray, pray and so forth, the, the custom there was that they always kneeled. So he said, we kneel for prayer. So he kneels before the altar and he says the prayers and so forth. And he stands up to turn around and give them the blessing. And all he sees are the backsides of all the people. And he's like, and then he realized they turned around and kneeled into the pew. So all their rear ends were facing the altar. And, uh, and he's like, and he goes, okay, he says, let's stand up. <laughs> but he said that he goes, he goes, Wow, talk about offense. He said, you know, right. yeah, but, but, yeah. He, it, but he didn't, you know, they said that we kneel, but they didn't tell them how, how he kneeled. Right. The idea, I want to touch on that very emphasis is the doing of a miracle is not depending upon whether people have faith or not. If it were, God would not convert us because we're spiritually dead. There's no faith there. He's the giver of faith. Again, this is a merciful thing done in, in judgment because it touches upon when he says, woe to these cities, he said, if the miracles done in you were have, would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago. And, and really what he's laying down, or when he says, woe to you, he's already condemned them. Yeah. And, and the, the refusal to do or not doing miracles, it's that he can't, his love will not allow him to do a miracle because he does not wish these people to have seen the miracle and then be judged by their refusal to uh, to believe. Right. So, but it's an interesting it way. Just, to put yeah, it, yeah, it's just the, the the wording of that. No, no, I I, uh, I get you. But uh, you know, I think we talked a lot about offense. I just wanted to, to kind of just touch on one thing with that. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about speaking the truth and everything, and and that if people are offended by that, then that's that's their rebellion. I, I think that it's very easy to take that and run with it and then not have to be careful with how we how we say things absolutely yep. and I, I think that there's a difference between the offense that our sinful nature finds with the words of god and the offense that we cause by our deliberate word choice to be hurtful the goal to, to the goal to offend yep, yep. you know and or i think that in, that's in your face kind of a yes right yes i think that's something that is detrimental to trying to proclaim this word. You know, that if people are offended because of the gospel, that is their rebellion against that. But if you're seeking out opportunities to cause offense and then using, well, people are offended because of the gospel as your justification, then that's... Yeah, and, and, and you'd be surprised how many people will come and tell you, Pastor, you need to preach sermons against homosexuality. You need to preach, uh, preach sermons against injustice. You need to preach... Preach and, and then you go through all of the well, quote unquote public sins. And one one gal and I said, okay, if I'm gonna preach against homosexuality, I'm gonna have to preach against living together right. uh, before marriage. And I go, oh, well, what do you mean? I said, that's just as big a sin. Sin is sin. Well, no, then I said, no, 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 you can't do that. We don't go looking for topics to preach on. We preach out of the word given us to preach. Right. And we do it in a way that hearts hear the law in a way that doesn't, the goal, I mean, the goal is to bring them to that moment of death, that they need salvation. Our goal is not to devastate. The hard part you have is you have to be aware of how a hearer hears. And that may sound like a deep thing, but you know, as well as I do, in family gatherings, well, you can't say anything about this because Aunt Harriet will go off the rails. And so forth. So you know how, or you use a particular term, and, and you see that in multi-generations. It's like you're saying this, and, 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 and I, you know, I, that's, right. out of my, that's out of my bailiwick. And, 
And so the goal is to, to again, and, and that's one of the things too that I think is so critical to understand and, and we might run a little bit longer, but there's a radical difference between communication and proclamation. These may sound like the same things, but Pastor and I and Pastor Climola, those preachers, they're called to proclaim the word, not communicate it. Now, that may sound like a nutsy, fagin thing, but in the actual sense for communication to happen. So if Pastor, Pastor, Cly Pastor Rushi is trying to communicate something to me, he's the sender. So he sends a message to me. Now, the only way communication happens is if I acknowledge, oh, yeah, I get that. If I don't have that, what does he have to do? Because to make sure communication happened, he has to modify what he's saying to get the response he wants from me. That's the co-part of it. Yeah. Is yeah. The, or the, the communion part of it is right. that it's the cooperative and, aspect. And see, whatever you're saying can always be modified until you get to that communion mm -hmm. of that. Okay. Proclamation is not, is basically holding forth truth for the sake of the hearer. Because it's the word of God, the only co-thing is the work of the Holy Spirit right. in the heart of the hearer. So what's our response? We don't just throw it out there, well, here's the word of God, otherwise we just read it. But then what is our call? Our call is to faithfully articulate or speak what the word is to us in ways that apply and, and, and connect and find place in our lives. Mm -hmm. And the gospel also spoken in terms of the problem and God's salvation. That takes time. Yeah. It, I, I, it, it just takes time, but no, you're, it's a very, very good point. We, we do not speak recklessly, but purposely. Mm -hmm. And that's you know really what, what Jesus is, and Isaiah was called to, I mean, Ezekiel was called to uh, as well. Any other thoughts as we uh, we finish this up here? Oh, one thing, one thing, I, uh, uh, real quick with this. The idea where Jesus says to take the dust off of your feet. Mm -hmm. One of the things I thought was interesting in a little research of that is some people act like it's a curse, you know, and it is a witness against it. But the idea of shaking the dust off of your feet was an understanding of a way of saying, we have labored among you. And now we're done. And so the shaking off of the dust was a way of saying, we labored among you with this and you would receive none of it. But I'm shaking the dust off. So, you know, we did labor here. Yeah. And, and you move on. But that's that's the message it's sending is that we did labor among you. And and see, the the interesting thing is, is, well, yeah, you did, but you didn't do the labor I wanted, and that's where it creates right. a whole new, yeah. and that's what tends to offend. But any other thoughts on this? No. It's a great text. I mean, and it's a great applicable text for us as we, you know, kind of move from worship into our week. You know, we, we, we hear the word on, on Sunday, and we, we live out that worship life, you know, that, that life of the believer Monday through Saturday, and Sunday included. It's the constant thing, and this is a great example of how we do that, you know, not being concerned about the failure or success of the, the sharing of, of the word, but rather sharing it because it's what we've been given to do. Yeah, and I think it, it I, I, I don't know that it, I think the big struggle for many people today is that um, with society and the pressures that are being brought to bear against uh, quote unquote religious morals and, and the like is it it is a, a time in which the mere fact that you confess Christ can offend people. It's never our goal to but the most critical thing is, is our goal is not to avoid offending people, but neither is our goal to offend people. Our goal is to be faithful to the word given us, to the word that we believe. And that's the most, that is the most realistic thing by which the world is converted. It converted the Roman Empire 
because people believed so much, no matter how offended Rome was, that they put him to death. They did not give up or cease to practice what they believe. And, and that's, that's where I think the real heavy lift is coming for us, is we have to stand in the face of people being offended. But just because they're offended doesn't keep us from being kind and caring right. and loving to them and so forth. It, in fact, it undermines the very, you know, the very thing that uh, would, they, you know, they would cause for dismissing us. So, yeah. Uh, a couple things just keep in mind. Uh, a blessed 4th of July, uh, or I hate using that term, it's Independence Day celebration because it is Independence Day. It falls on 4th of July, but uh, safe, uh, safe celebrations for that. And the like, uh, don't forget, we still have Wednesday morning Bible class. We start this Wednesday, 10 a.m., looking at the Psalm of God's Attributes, which is Psalm 139, and that's 10 a.m. At win on Wednesday mornings. Uh, anything else in the week ahead? Uh, not in the week ahead, but keep, uh, keep in mind, VBS, at the end of this month, it is already July. Uh, seems wild to think that, but it is. Uh, end of this month is VBS. So I think there's still opportunities to register or oh, to is, even yeah. volunteer. Uh, you know, so if, if you're, if you felt, if you feel led to do that, we'd, we'd love to have you help out or to, to send your kids. We rejoice. We're already over 50 students registered yeah. and you can register at Trinity Lutheran.org slash VBS. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, very much, uh, do that. Also keep our, uh, Call committee for our uh, Minister of Music in your prayers. We're reaching out to uh, five additional candidates to interview. We hope soon and uh, hopefully by God's gift and guidance, we will be able to call a new music minister as this week, uh, our uh, 10 years plus, uh, Marianne Hibbert Deaconess has been our music minister and she retired. So uh, officially retired on yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, well, we'll get to see her. She's gonna yes. be filling in as an organist yeah. for us. Uh, in the months ahead. But uh, with that, God's richest blessings on your day and may uh, his angels watch over you, his spirit inspire you and the word uh, give you a steady step every day. Have a great weekend.